This is a book poll summary of the book, Freakonomics, by Stephen J. Levitt and Stephen D. Dubner. Did you know that everyone around you, from politicians to significant other, has an angle and wants to influence your behavior? They rely on incentives to encourage you to do good or avoid doing badly. Incentives come in three forms, economic, social, and moral, and the most effective ones use all three. When it comes to crime, incentives play a crucial role in preventing people from cheating, stealing, or scamming. The fear of jail and the financial loss serves an economic incentive, while the moral incentive prevents people from feeling like bad people. And let's not forget the social incentive. Nobody wants to be seen as a criminal. In short, incentives can hit your wallet, pride, or conscience, so be careful. Incentives. When good intentions go awry. We've all been tempted with rewards for doing what we're supposed to do, like offering candy to a kid who finishes their homework or giving bonuses to employees who meet sales goals. But it turns out that incentives can have some unexpected consequences on behavior. In a study of daycare centers, researchers tried to reduce the number of late pickups by introducing a $3 fine. But instead of improving punctuality, the change actually caused late pickups to double. Why did this happen? Well, the small fine may not have been enough to make parents take the issue seriously, but more importantly, the fine replaced the moral dissentive of feeling guilty about being late. Now parents could pay just a few bucks to assuage their guilt, so they were less concerned about arriving on time. The lesson here is that setting incentives can be tricky business, so before you start dangling rewards, think about whether they might actually undermine other motivations that are already in place. Context is key. Incentives work differently depending on the situation. Let's face it, most of us wouldn't even dream of robbing a bank, unless you count monopoly money. But why do some people go ahead with it despite the obvious consequences? It all comes down to how different people react to the same incentives. And even one person can react differently to the same incentives on different occasions. Just ask Paul Fieldman who ran a bagel business and discovered that payment rates vary depending on a range of factors, from the weather to office morale. So when it comes to incentives, context is key. What works on a sunny day might not work when it's raining, and what works for you today might not work for you tomorrow, depending on your personal circumstances and mood. Don't let experts exploit your lack of knowledge. If you're finding this video to be enjoyable, show your support by liking it and subscribing to my channel for even more fantastic content. Your encouragement means everything to me and drives me to keep creating videos for you. We all need expert help sometimes, but relying solely on their advice can be risky. Experts have access to valuable information that can create an uneven playing field, and some may use this advantage to exploit lay people for extra gain. For example, when selling a house, real estate agents may prioritize closing the deal quickly over getting the best price for the client. Research shows that agents sell their own homes for a higher price and leave them on the market longer than when commissioned by clients. So it's important to do your own research and not rely solely on experts' advice. Beware the fear factor. How experts can trick you into spending more money. We've all been in situations where we don't know what to do and feel anxious, and unfortunately, experts can take advantage of this fear to make a profit. From car salesmen to funeral directors, they use fear to push you into decisions that benefit them more than you. Be cautious of situations where an expert pressures you to make an immediate decision. Take your time, ask for a second opinion, and do your own research. Fear clouds judgment, so stay calm, be prepared, and keep your wits about you to avoid being taken advantage of. The Internet's Impact on Reducing Informational Asymmetries Thanks to the internet, experts can't pull a fast one on us anymore. Back in the 90s, life insurance prices took a nosedive, and it wasn't because of a sudden influx on immortal people. Nope, it was all thanks to the internet and the rise of price comparison sites. Suddenly, customers could compare prices from tons of different companies in a matter of seconds. And as these policies were pretty similar, their pricier companies had to lower their prices or risk losing out on customers. This little anecdote shows just how much of an impact the internet has had on reducing information asymmetries around the world. 
It's a super efficient way to share info from those in the know with those who aren't. Nowadays, consumers can quickly and easily find out all of the deets about their product or service before even talking to an expert. This means we can't be duped into paying more than we should. For example, if you're buying a house, you don't have to rely solely on your estate agent's advice anymore. You can hop online and figure out for yourself what a fair price would be. So, thanks to the internet, experts can't pull a fast load on us anymore. The high cost of withholding information from customers. Buying without having all the necessary information can lead to a negative consequence. Sellers who fail to disclose important information can be penalized by customers who assume the worst. This information asymmetry can cause buyers to discount prices, as in the case of a new car losing a quarter of its value when driven off the lot. The same applies to online dating where a lack of a photo can decrease the chance of fighting a match. To avoid penalties, Sellers must be transparent and upfront with all information. Honesty and openness build trust and loyalty with customers. The irrationality of risk assessment. We are not as rational as we think when it comes to assessing risks. Our perceptions are swayed by factors like media coverage and our sense of control, causing us to overestimate the risk of visible but rare events and underestimate the risk of less prominent ones. Even though flying is statistically safer than driving, our fear of flying is driven by our sense of control. To make more rational evaluations of risk, we must first recognize our biases and rely on solid facts and data, rather than media hype or feelings. The Correlation vs. Causation Conundrum Have you ever assumed that just because two things happen at the same time, one must be causing the other? Like when you wear your lucky socks and your team wins, so you start to think your socks are the secret to their success? Correlation doesn't imply causation. For instance, having more police officers doesn't necessarily cause more homicides, and spending more money on political campaigns doesn't always lead to winning elections. We tend to assume causality when there may only be correlation between two things happening at the same time. It's essential to consider all the possible explanations and avoid making assumptions. The danger of ignoring remote causes when attributing causality you know how they say correlation doesn't imply causation? Well, it turns out that even when we do find a correlation, we often overlook the real causes and go for the most obvious ones. Take crime, for example. In the late 1980s, crime rates in the U.S. were skyrocketing. Experts predicted that it would only get worse. But then something unexpected happened. Crime rates dropped dramatically in the early 1990s. So what caused the sudden decline in crime? The experts had plenty of theories. The economy was improving, gun control was getting tougher, police were innovating, and more people were being put in prison. But here's the funny thing. Most of these factors had little to no effect on crime rates. The real cause of the drop of crime was something that nobody had even considered at the time. Abortions. How does that work, you ask? Well, it turns out that growing up in a single-parent household and living in poverty are two of the biggest predictors of future criminal behavior. And these just ha so happen to be the most common reasons why people choose to have abortions. So when abortion was legalized across the U.S. in 1973, it meant that fewer kids who were likely to turn it to crime were being born. And that's why crime rates dropped in the early 1990s. The lesson here? Don't always go for obvious explanations when trying to figure out what caused something. Sometimes, the real cause is hidden in plain sight, and you have to dig a little deeper to find it. We hope this video provided valuable insights and information for you. Is it better to assume causality when there is a correlation between two things, or to consider all the possible explanations and avoid making assumptions? Let us know in the comments. And if you learned something new in this video, make sure to hit the button and subscribe for more videos. Thank you, and until next time.